Good morning, everyone. We're kind of in the eye of the storm between holidays. It's good to see everyone. Got a great group this morning, and we're glad everyone is here, and we're glad those who are at home watching on live stream are able to join us that way. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 27, begins this way. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. These are words that can strike fear in the hearts of those who desire to please God. We want to be sure that we get this right. And it's right that we should want to get this right. And I agree that that's what this scripture teaches, that we ought to get it right. But the question is, what did Paul mean when he said these words in context? And so, what does it mean to get it right? That's what we're going to talk about for a little while this morning. Let's begin by asking three questions about the verses I just read in context. The first question can be answered as quickly as it is asked. The Lord's Supper. What is the subject of the first letter from Paul to the church at Corinth? And the answer is strife. One word answer. The basic answer to the question, the theme that went all the way through the book was how to get along when you disagree about things. And they disagreed about a lot of things. They couldn't get, to get it together over anything. It was the Wild West in early Christianity. Second question, why does Paul in chapter 11 suddenly begin talking about the Lord's Supper? And the quick answer is he doesn't, and I hope to prove that to you. He begins talking about the Lord's Supper all the way back in chapter 10 in the first few verses. And I'm going to try to help us all to see that together. And then the third question, how do we avoid taking the supper in an unworthy manner? And that will be the final question that we'll spend most of our time on this morning. So, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And I'm not going to quote those right now. I've learned that when you read Paul, you read in layers, that Paul has a basic point, and then he layers on thoughts above the basic point that he makes. And that's what he does here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. So let's strip away all of the extraneous material to start with, all the higher layers, and just get down to the basics, what he said. This is what he said. He said, remember our ancestors, and he's of course talking about the ancestors of the Jews. He said, they were all under the cloud. You remember the cloud of pillar that they followed by day and that rested upon the camp by night? And they all passed through the sea. You remember how they went through the waters, the sea parted and they crossed as though on dry ground. And they all passed through the sea together and they all ate the same food and they all drank the same drink. Notice anything about what we got up there so far? Paul's talking about what they all did. They all did this, they all did this, they all did this, they all did this. And I even left out one that I'm going to save for, another, for, for a minute later. But why did they all do all of these things together? Because they needed water, and there was one place that they could get that water. They all drank from the rock. It was the rock that held them all together in community. If they should leave the community, they wouldn't have the rock. And so they wouldn't have drink, and they would die in three days. If not by thirst, they would die from wild animals and from hostile nations around them. So they needed to be together. They needed that community. Okay, but I left out some things, didn't I? So let's start layering on now with Paul. So I'm going to create a little space here. And right in the middle of all this, I'm going to put what Paul said next. He said, all were baptized into Moses. Now, wait a minute, Paul. We don't think about baptism necessarily when we think of those Old Testament scriptures, do we? 
We're baptized, we're all baptized, but we don't necessarily think about the children of Israel being baptized in the cloud, which they were immersed in the cloud, and in the sea in a figure. They had the sea on all sides of them, and they were baptized as they went through. And Romans chapter 6 will tell you the spiritual meaning of all that and how we're freed from sin when we pass through. So Paul is dragging us into the story here, isn't he? He's asking us now not to think just of those people who lived under the law of Moses, but he's asking us to think of how we get dragged into this story. And he, and he further drags us into the story when he says that they all ate the same food, the manna. Well, he didn't just say food. He said spiritual food. What? Manna is physical food. It came down from heaven. But do you remember... Um, Jesus saying, I'm the bread from heaven, making himself the manna. And Paul said, they all drink the same spiritual drink. Do you remember Jesus saying that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in the kingdom? Okay, so again, Paul is drawing us deeper into this story in such a way that we, now we identify with the words that he's speaking. For they all drank from the spiritual rock. And now in our English versions, the word rock is capitalized. That was added by the translators because by now it's obvious that he's talking about Jesus. And if it wasn't enough by implication, you can see it. He spelled, Paul spells it out for you. The spiritual rock that followed them, they drank, in, drank from a rock in more than one place, didn't they? So this providence followed them through the wilderness, and that rock was Christ. Now, some people have said that that means that the rock that was present in the wilderness, this physical presence, was actually a manifestation of Christ. Well, maybe that's what he means, but doesn't seem to be what he means in context here, does it? Really seems to mean that what happened in the Old Testament is a figure for us to learn from about our providence, about our rock that uh, follows us through our wilderness and provides for us spiritual food and spiritual drink. And we all do that, the basic point, remember, underneath all the layers is that it's all done all, 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 we, didn't, we all do this together. Why? Because we drink from the spiritual rock that follows us. We have been set free from slavery. We are following God by faith. We all have been baptized into Christ, not into Moses. We all eat the same spiritual food. We all drink the same spiritual drink, and we depend on the rock to sustain us. So now we are fully found in those verses. The second time Paul mentions the Lord's Supper, he makes some points from that. He goes on to make some points about the way we should live, but the second time he mentions it explicitly is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, where he says, the cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Now, the cup is the physical reality. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And this is how it spiritually relates to us. That physical reality relates to us in a spiritual way. It is the blood of Christ, and we are participants. It is our participation in the blood of Christ. You're... Uh, your version might say participation, or it might say it is a communion, very similar to the word community or commune. It's things that are done together. We have it in common. We just sang about a common love for each other. So these things are all done together, the cup of blessing that we bless. We commonly take of it as the memorial of the blood of Christ and the bread that we break. Is it not a participation in the body? So the bread is the body. We know that. We're all participating in it. That's the Lord's Supper. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. 
Okay, now wait a minute. We're transferring the body. Now it's no longer just the body of Christ hanging on the cross. This is the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ because we are one bread and we all are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So when we commune with this bread, we become that body. Now that will be important in chapter 11. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we indicate and illustrate that we are the one cohesive body of Christ. But that is not what was happening in Corinth. I can assure you that none of us has ever seen anything like what was going on there in our assemblies. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 17, Paul scolds the brethren for what they had done to the Lord's Supper. They had taken this emblem of unity and turned it into yet another way of being divided. So lavish were some of the meals that, that the people were eating that the poor and hungry were put to shame because of how little they brought to the meal. Some got started way before others, so much so that they were able to get intoxicated on the wine that they were drinking before others even arrived. Paul said, am I supposed to commend you for this? I can't condone this. So he reminded them of the simplicity of the original supper and the significance of the bread and the cup. The bread, he said, is the body of Christ, and you are the body of Christ. The cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ, and you are all together partakers in that covenant. It must not be done as a source of division, but as a proclamation of unity. So what would this mean in context to partake in an unworthy manner? Paul says that when you fail to discern the body, you eat and drink judgment to yourself. That's a very strong statement. What does it mean? Failure to discern the body. First of all, it means discern, and that's distinguish between two things. The Greek word for discern is like discriminate between two things. In this case, the Corinthians had confused the holy with the ordinary. Confusing the holy with the ordinary. This is the ordinary. This is the holy, okay? Let's not confuse those two things. Let's make sure we understand clearly in our mind that they're two different things. When we come together to eat the supper, it's not an ordinary supper. It's a holy supper. The Lord's Supper is the holiest rite in which we participate collectively because it illustrates Christ in us and us in him, united in one body, Never forget that when you eat this supper, you're not just eating. You are proclaiming your participation in the Lord's sacrifice along with others who are proclaiming the same thing. Second of all, consider the body. Consider the relationships. Think back again to the Old Testament and the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. For what did God punish them most severely? On one occasion, he struck down a pair of insubordinate priests who offered that which was common on a holy altar. On another, he struck down rebels who would have torn the community apart and sent many of them packing back to Egypt, a rend in the body. These are the same attitudes for which Paul scolds the Corinthians, confusing the holy with the ordinary and divisiveness. So, what do we make of it? Uh, 
consider our mutual dependence on the rock that unites us and how that dependency brings us to a community of believers. The Lord's Supper is spiritual food that unites us in community, just as the Israelites were united around their rock as they followed God's leading through the wilderness. We are that body, and we should do everything possible to maintain its cohesiveness so that we eat our spiritual food and drink our spiritual drink together, living in the Lord's providence. If we come to this meal with division in our hearts, we eat and drink damnation to ourselves. So what does it mean to eat and drink unworthily? It means to, the come, to, the, to come to the table thinking that what we do is ordinary. It's not. And because it is one of the holy things, we do not desecrate it with a spirit of division, but we approach it, we approach it considering the body. And that means, yes, the body of Christ on the cross, but also remembering that we are that singular, undivided body. That doesn't require us to be more than we can be. It simply requires us to consider one another. And so that's what we do together now.